This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Colin Kemmerer, an American behavioral economist and a Robert Kirby Professor of Behavioral Finance and Economics at the California Institute of Technology, otherwise known as Caltech. Colin brings a damn interesting perspective to my show. Behavioral economics, game theory, neuroscience, he's got his hands dipped into everything. All the cool stuff. Want to know what's going on inside our minds when we make the decision to run up that bubble? What is actually igniting? What can you see inside the mind at the moment of a crash? What does the mind look like as the bubble extends up? Some of the fascinating topic areas that Colin goes into. I feel forever fortunate that I can have some of the brightest people in our modern day world appear and just talk a little shop with me. I hope you enjoy this episode with Colin Kammerer. Oxford's a cool place, very, uh, very mellow. There's this old Pink Floyd song that's about staying off the grass. What's the song? The lunatics are on the grass. And that was all about not walking on the grass in Oxford. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They actually, you know, I, I, now that you mention it, they are kind of fussy about that. They have these huge <laughs> grassy areas. There, I think there's a few parks where it's quite a, it's p- people picnic and stuff like that. The, the place that I'm kind of hanging out is called All Souls College. And, it, you know, once you go inside, there's these huge grassy quad and it it's, you know, it's just kind of showing off, right? <laughs> like it's not used for anything. <laughs> if you tra- if you traipsed across it, someone would come and scold you. Anyway, yeah, I, I'd probably listen to that lyric. Who knows how many times from Roger Waters over the years, and I never knew that the lunatic on the grass was a reference to that. So, yeah, uh, yeah. But hey, let me let me jump back before we get into the to the meaty grist here. I'm curious about something in your background, and there's just the one little line on Wikipedia that I see, and it says "child prodigy." And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, I had a I had a, a nice lady on my show recently, a female grandmaster in chess, and she was she was called a child prodigy. And we talked about this, and and her family, her sister is a grandmaster as well, and her her father was a very wise guy, but she really came at it from the the nurture side of it instead of the nature side. First, I'm curious, why were you classified that for your particular situation? And how do you see it in, in terms of nurture versus nature? Well, actually, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting story. But so what happened is there's a fairly famous educational psychologist called Julian Stanley. He's, he died a few years ago. And he was always interested. He was at Johns Hopkins University, which is happened to be. I lived in Baltimore, and I happened to go to college there. But it was, that part's a bit of a coincidence. He was always he was very interested in gift. What was then called gifted children. You know, how do you take kids who are really good at math, maybe other things, but things that are kind of easy to measure at, at age 10, 12, 13, You know what I mean? It'd be hard to tell. Typically, I think with an eleven year old, if they're going to be a great novelist or politician or something like that, right? Math you can measure. And so his idea was, how do you find these kids, and then what do you do? And so he had a very simple idea, which it, it's very – looking back, it's one of these things. Why didn't anyone think of it? Well, nobody thought of it until him. And just like you know, with a music prodigy, what you do is you give an eight-year-old kid a really hard piece of music to play, right? You don't give them chopsticks and have them play it five times over. You, know, you, you give them something they should – there's no way they should be able to play, and some of the kids can play it. And so what he did was he started giving the SAT high school test to which typically you know kids take at age seventeen to twelve uh, year olds. Uh, most of the stuff on the on the test like algebra you know the kids have never seen so they have to just kind of guess on the fly. And there's reading comprehension you know so you know these are tweens basically right taking a test for high school kids. And what he found was you know you get. And now it's done nationally with probably hundreds on the scale of hundreds of thousands of kids can take it. 
And what he found was every year you turn up a few hundred kids who get over 700. Then the question is, if these kids in their regular classes, like in sixth or seventh grade, are just wasting their time, what do you do? You know, do you do it? And the time I, I went, so anyway, I went in this program and I scored very high in the SCT at a young age. And so that was the definition of a prodigy. And it, you know, it didn't involve really anything subjective, although, you know, my teachers all thought I was very smart and I was, you know, da, da, da. Um, but, you know, I did well on this test. Uh, my, you know, and again, if you, if you think about athletes and musicians, it, it's exactly the same type of thing you do, right? You might have a 15 year old kid and you have them, you know, play with a bunch of college kids who are pretty good and you see if the 15 year old kid might beat them, you know? The thing that I didn't like about the word prodigy whenever I see it is because it, I think to some degree it marginalizes any effort that takes place after yeah, the yeah. test. Because I'm sure some kids scored great on that test and have not put the, the pedal to the metal like you have, so to speak. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it, it, you know, when, when I was going through this, the whole idea of gifted was kind of weird because, you know, a gift is something you should be kind of grateful for. And there was a whole thing about, well, you know, when you find these kids who are so extraordinary, you know, do they have a social obligation to like become a professor or should, should they go run hedge funds, you know, and make a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. And for at first, that was just too much to, to put on a 12 or 14 year old kid's shoulders, right? It's like, you know, just grow up, you know, and if you love, if you're introverted and you love doing math, so I went to this class where we on Saturday mornings we would do math with a fantastic teacher with a bunch of other kids. And basically we learned like, you know, three years of math in one year of Saturday mornings because we could go so fast. And that was really fun, you know? So then people said, oh, but you're not letting the kid grow up, you know, but much like with the chess uh, prodigies or with young, gym, you know, female gymnasts and things like that, right? They're in the gym eight hours a day. I don't know. You must have figured something out about growing up. You, you had this this punk music uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, love, so uh, you know I can I can sit here as I'm in Saigon. I, I'm very close to Cambodia. I can think of a holiday in Cambodia the by dead the dead Kennedys. Kennedys. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I, I love yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but okay, let me jump into the serious stuff. So I've only got you for yeah. a brief bit of time. So behavioral economics. This is kind of where you start in. But as, as I've seen you talk about it, you know, behavioral economics kind of is is moving in two paths. You got the, kind of the field work and the data. Then you have the folks, and I think this is where you are. What's going on inside the brain? When right. did you make that shift where you said, okay, I love behavioral economics. This I love the structure, but now I want to. I mean, it's like the next logical step, of course, but it's now it's synthesizing so many different fields to take it in an entirely different direction. When did you make that shift? What caused you to say, hmm, I'm going to connect neuroscience now, too? So there were, there were, there was a series of events, and then the rest was, you know, just kind of a seeing an interesting opportunity. So my, uh, my close friend, George Lowenstein, is also a, a behavioral economist. He basically knew a bunch of neuro people who I didn't know, particularly John Cohen, who's at Princeton, uh, who was then at Pittsburgh, where George was, and a few other people. And George had, had been interested in addiction, so he met a bunch of people, clinicians who worked with addicts, who were interested in brain malfunction and addiction. And, you know, so he just, he kind of introduced me. We had a little conference in 1997. And introduced me to um, these folks. And it was pretty clear at that time, at the end of the conference, there was a huge gulf between the way economists think, thought about this and what the clinicians and neuroscientists had to say. But it was interesting. And also, I think my, my kind of brand in behavioral economics to some extent is trying to always pioneer new ways of measuring stuff and push the frontiers in, in, on methods. You know, So at that time, nobody was thinking, oh, uh, we should study the brain. Okay, so fast forward about 2003 – we get a human brain scanner at Caltech. Thank you, Gordon Moore of Moore's Law fame, Eli Broad. It may, this is kind of amazing. Amazingly, in our biology group at Caltech, most people are not interested in human beings. And the reason is the, the specific things they're interested in studying are usually better studied in a simpler animal. People are too complicated. And so if you want to study sleep, uh, like one of my colleagues does, what you do is you study zebrafish larvae because they're transparent. So you can look at them and see what's happening when they're awake and sleeping. And if human beings, if human babies were transparent, he would study human babies, but they're not. Anyway, so the result of that was that they built this human scanner and said, who wants to scan people? And none of the biologists were interested. I shouldn't say none, but very few, just a couple. And they were all, they were people we were kind of collaborating with and knew, talked about. So there was sort of this field of dreams, you know, kind of scanner. If you build it, they will come. And because of that, and just because Caltech is a wonderful place that's genuinely very encouraging about interdisciplinary work, which every university hopes to be, and some are better at it than others. 
they were very, very encouraging. Like, why don't you guys come in and use this um, scanner if you want? And they kind of priced it so that, uh, you know, the, the machine itself is very expensive. But it was kind of like a, you know, early user discount. You know, you can use it without paying too much money if you have some ideas just to get the thing going and show that we deserve to have it <laughs> to show the donors, you know, that we're doing something. And so we got a tremendous amount of help from the the technical staff on kind of how to actually get a brain image and then there were a bunch of people in biology not again not many who kind of you know i'd go over and show them a picture of the brain like what is this area and what should i read so we had this kind of crash course on how to do brain scanning and use other techniques at that time also behavioral economics was really flourishing and has continued to and the frontier of the math people do has gone beyond what i can do despite um being pretty good at math so there are people working on mathematical, you know, how to get psychology into an equation who are really extraordinary. And it's like, I'm just going to let them do it and read their papers. A lot of people are also going out in field and doing experiments in, um, on nudges, you know, to, to see how you can get people to save more money or change their behavior. And I'm not, we're not great at that doing that compared to a lot of other places that have incredibly good connections with NGOs and stuff like that. So I thought, oh, this is something special I can do that no one's going to compete with for a while. I think that's a fair assessment. You know, I caught the one line. I think this is this even takes us in a little bit deeper to where I want to go. And this is from you. Uh, quote, imagine if you could go on the floor of the stock exchange and see what was going on in the traders' brains, end quote. Now, that there's Pandora's box right there. It's like, right? Because we could yeah, that, yeah. that starts to go off and who knows what directions. But I think what's really interesting about that statement, I'm not sure exactly when you made it, but of course, the trading floors are disappearing. So even the analysis that we might have seen of the physical human beings, I mean, the Chicago floors are disappearing like crazy. They're almost all gone. Even if we could see that analysis, we're now shifting to something where it's more the solo person in front of their computer. And then it's not necessarily only the solo person in front of their computer, because that's the way that most people think that most trading goes on. But, you know, in my world, I see some of the greatest traders are 100% systematic. There, There is no active watching the screens. They might be trading one data point for a weekly bar per week and making decisions off that kind of thing. So in that sense, the trader designs his system, puts it in action, but I don't really, I, I'm thinking when would be the moment where somebody like you could go in and see from a brain scan perspective something going on if they're not even looking at the markets necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, no, that's certainly a challenge when you, know, when you think about any of these studies. You know, the same with things like addiction. So if you think, well, people are succumbing to temptation. In, in, in the world of neuroeconomics, every English statement like that we take very literally as a biological claim. So what does it mean to succumb? Mm. <laughs> what, you know, what does a succumbing brain picture look like? When, when exactly is the key moment, right? So that, some of those things are going to be pretty hard. And also I, I should m mention a very important point, which is even though brain scanning gets all the glamorous attention, it's like the, you know, the, the handsomest Baldwin brother or something like that. There are a lot of other methods we use and all of them are cheaper and more portable than um, neuroimaging. So you can study skin conductance and heart rate. A few people have done that. We, you, something that's pretty portable is EEG, where you put little electrodes around your head and see what um, electrical activity is doing. You know what? What you'd like to do for some of these other problems like addiction would be to have somebody being monitored with sensors. You know, for a long period of time. So. You don't necessarily have to guess, you know, when the key moment of succumbing to temptation really is. And the same with traders, right? So if you, if, if you were kind of measuring things that were happening biologically that would help you make guesses about the brain, not just measuring the brain as so directly, if you, if you do it for long periods of time, then, you know, suddenly there are epiphanies or somebody says, I had an idea or I saw something, you know, I was reading something in the newspaper and you could try to capture that. You know, I just gave you the example, though, of like, say, okay, uh, traders with a specific system that perhaps has worked for a long time. But if we go more general and go to the average person and start to say, because I still think there's a lot of interesting insights here, the average person, you start to see to yourself, could we stimulate the brain to create bubbles? Could we stimulate the brain to create crashes? These are fascinating questions that you're asking. The answer to most of those questions is, is not yet, but someday for sure. Paint, paint a little picture there. I know that, that can get extremely detailed, of course, very detailed. But paint a little broad picture for, for how uh, even the smart, inexperienced person, a lay person, even some of the sophisticated fund managers that listen to my podcast, explain how we might get to that point where 
you could stimulate the brain to create a bubble. Okay, so so I'll start with the most direct way we would do it in the lab, and then I'll say a little bit about scaling, which is something we don't we don't worry about too much. I mean, we're sort of in the basic research business, right? Step one, but the scaling in practice is interesting, and and obviously. Um, it's really important and challenging in its own way. So in the basic research, it, the recipe is something like the following. And we've gone partway down this path with published research already. So first, you you create a situation in which people are trading something. Maybe it's a lifelike situation, like um, you know, you're monitoring traders in the Shanghai stock market, which seems to be in a crazy, just insane bubble recently, or some other thing. Or it, it, our preferred method, step one method, is to create an artificial asset. At the end, it's going to get exchanged for money that they're going to actually get paid by us. And so we can control the fundamental value. We can say what this thing really should be worth. And then a bubble is when the price goes way above that. That's it. So it gets it sidesteps the tricky question in most markets, like is Shanghai in a bubble? I don't, you know, I'm not that sure because I don't know what the fundamental value of all those stocks is. And the same with IPOs, you know, is Uber worth 40 billion? You know, I don't know. I mean, it seems like a high number, but it's very difficult to estimate the fundamental, right, for companies like that. We would first run an experiment in which people trade. We could then see from the prices whether there's a bubble or not. We can also ask them some questions. We could measure something in their brain or their body. Are they getting anxious? Are they getting euphoric or kind of caught up? You know, uh, whatever um, you want to do. And then once we have an idea, for example, in our study so far that we have the most confidence in, we found that in the, the traders who did well, which meant they got out before the crash in this little lab experiment and made the most money. They made tw- twice as much as the everyone else. Uh, there was activity in a region called insula, which is um, thought to be part of what's called an interoceptive system, which means it's your brain's making sense of what's going on in the body. And also many studies have shown it's activated when there's when there's financial uncertainty or other kinds of uncertainty, like you know, is this am I going to win this gamble? Is the, and so forth. And so the whole thing kind of made sense, right? Basically, the, the the smart traders have this early warning signal in this insular region that says, you know, even though prices have been going up very very smoothly, when you look at the chart, you know, what's going to happen in the future is getting more and more uncertain, and then and also those people sell more. So the key is that they get this insula signal and they sell. And not all the, the other traders who don't keep riding the bubble all the way through and they get creamed. The way you would stimulate a crash would be to go in and at some point generate activity in the insula. So this is what's called incidental emotion. In other words, you know, the idea is we would, we would, for example, give them another thing that activates insula very reliably is a disgusting picture or a, a frightening picture. So you show them a quick picture of somebody you know with a gaping wound a fearful face we we know from quite a bit of um, emotion neuroscience how these things actually operate in the brain and the idea would be that you would stimulate the insulin in some way and then see if that external cause generates the same behavioral response it might not by the way i mean it could it might not it might be that people say oh i just saw this picture but it has nothing to do with stocks the idea would be that this emotional stimulation would cause some people to sell. And in these markets, usually you have the property, at least the ones we've studied, uh, and they're kind of thin markets. So a few people selling is going to really move the market. What happens is if a few people start to sell, the price will increase, will slow down. At some point, the price goes down, and then it's just like um, you know a snowball picking up momentum. You know, once the price goes down a few periods, it never comes back in, a, in our experiments. And again, that's, that's not a typical feature of markets. They go up and down all the time. So you have these kind of zigzag, which we don't reproduce in the very simplest type of experiments. So that's how you would do it. You would, you would, in, in, and to be honest, in a few human studies, they're, they're hard to do mostly for ethical reasons, but there are some old studies in which you stimulate directly, like you put an electrode in a region and then you send electricity in there. But we that, that can be done with epileptic patients who have electrodes implanted so the surgeons can try to figure out where these seizures are coming from and then they're going to cut out a tiny bit of the brain. These are very last resort things you know, for patients who, um, who don't respond to drugs and other treatments. And so there have been a few studies like that, but they're not very many patients. They're, you know, they're not even, obviously really a random sample of people. So there, there are various methods to try to do this, something like a stimulation. 
Yeah, you go down you go down that bubbles direction, the idea of creating a bubble, perhaps creating a crash. One can't help but think, and you mentioned that you just said a second ago, the ethical because here you are, you're trying to figure out the puzzle, right? You're you're just yes. saying what's the puzzle here? And you're not you're not necessarily you, but you obviously there's ethical considerations. And so if we imagine this a few steps down the road, the to have the ability to to do this, either for good or bad, uh, opens up uh, an assortment of ethical issues, doesn't it? Yes, oh, absolutely. I mean, fortunately for us, they're not the worst ethical issues in neuroscience, in which there, there are others that are um, really kind of mind bending and quite kind of sad and, and extremely difficult. You know, I mean, I, I won't get too distracted, but there, there, there are other questions you could imagine involving neuroscience and law, for, say, or, you know, detecting lie detection. And, you know, is, are we at a point where we could use that in the legal proceedings? And, you mm. know, I, I think the answer is no, but other people think yes. That's a can of worms, to say the least, huh? Yeah, no kidding. And, um, and we do, I do think the, the scientific community as a whole has some responsibility for contributing to the ethical debate. You know, the, the typical reaction of most people is, well, that's not my problem. But, you know, it's like building the atomic bomb or something. If you generated a scientific thing and people may use it in some particular way, I think it's you know, you have a certain amount of responsibility to at least participate in a conversation or get the thing moving. But I think the, the mildest way I would think of it is the following, which raises the least ethical obligation, which is what I what we think is going on in some types of bubbles is that, that the traders are not being sufficiently cautious about the underlying uncertainty, that really this thing is much more uncertain than it might seem. For example, um, there are a lot of theories now about uh, trend chasing or momentum investing or um, it, it's called extrapolative expectations. You know, so the thing went up last time and you think it'll go up again. And the, the ironic thing about this is if you treat it as kind of a statistical puzzle, like if you see a curve and it's just going up and up and up and climbing up, you know, you're going to think it's going to keep going. And so, so the, pers- the sense of uncertainty a lot of traders have is that it's not very uncertain because it looks like this beautiful little graph. But it is uncertain. It's getting more and more uncertain. And so stimulating the insula is just a particular crude, aggressive way to tell the brain directly, be more afraid than you are or be more cautious than you are. And in practice, here's the scaling up finally. In practice, it might be that Fed Chair Yellen or somebody who people believe says, you know, I think stocks may be overvalued and, and, and we probably aren't pricing in crash risks sufficiently or something of that kind. And it may be that that's enough, you know, to, to slow down an overheated market. I mean, and again, the, the other thing that's very tricky about this is the only way bubbles really end is with crashes. So what you would like would be a world in which it's more like a balloon where you kind of let some of the air out of the stock, you know? So, Let's say we think the Shanghai market is overheated. You know, you might like it, like it to go down by twenty five percent over two years, right? But the, I think there's no way we'll ever have enough control over that process to be able to manage the sort of this deflation. You know, like landing a space shuttle, right? You don't want it to bang. And so, probably bubbles will have to end in crashes, and crashes generally aren't great. I mean, it's 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 similar to just you know peeling the band aid off. You can do it slow and it really, really hurts, or you can do it fast to get it over with. And you know, of course, of course, for many markets, I mean, look at the the futures markets, for example, these are zero sum. So no matter what you do, there's never going to be only a winner. It it just doesn't work that way. Correct, correct. If you induce these kind of crashes, people who are buying at the peak will be mad and disappointed. But, and and it's, you know, so you have to make your piece, whether it's as a politician or so forth, about you know what that means which i think is what's really interesting about some types of trading strategies that are designed to say you know what i'm kind of like the mit blackjack team i don't know anything i don't know any fundamental information but i can look at the price data point and so i'm going to track 40 or 50 of the most liquid currencies interest rates stock indices and i don't know that i'm going to end up shorting crude oil over the course of 2014 and make a fortune but that was my target of opportunity that appeared on the screen. I was kind of going with the momentum. I had my stop losses. I know what the disposition effect is, and I wrote it, and I got out, and I just happened to make money, and I, I, you know, I'm thinking about expected value, and instead of what most people do, most people think about, okay, let me get lots of small gains, and they don't think about those infrequent large losses. 
These types of traders say, you know what, I'm gonna take lots of small losses, but I want it, I want to ultimately get those infrequent large wins. And so it's it, it, your work is just fascinating. I'd love to see it kind of start to synthesize into some of these uh, large funds that trade that way. It just it just is a whole nother wrinkle. I, I'm I'm jealous. You're in an cr- interesting spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was just I was talking to somebody from um, a tech company last night, and the, uh, the the other thing I'm interested in, but it hasn't been high, as high on my research agenda is it's related to the question of scaling too. What you know, we learn something from the brain and this re- tiny little claustrophobic scanner, and then can we do things in the world? Is how we use so-called big data. You know, lots and lots of types of data about all kinds of things, and so I think that's going to be. Um, I, I can't say it's going to be a frontier for behavioral economics because it's going to be a frontier for everything in social science. You know, we just have a, a tremendous amount of data on on all kinds of stuff. You know, an approach that we that we've been studying coming from computer science from quite a long time ago is usually called machine learning or data mining. Mm. The idea is, you know, you have tons and tons of measures. For example, this is kind of how we do the uh, brain theory. You know, if you have 50,000 voxels, the kind of artificial cubes in the brain, we've divided the brain up in that way, like pixels on a computer screen. You have 50,000 voxels, and some of the studies say, well, which of those 100 are, you know, telling us what a person is looking at? For example, that's called neural decoding. And if you if you use not just a brain image, but now skin conductance or um, facial recognition is something that's becoming extremely um, effective, you know, at my webcam right now could look at my face and say quite a bit about whether I'm tired or enthusiastic or sad or afraid. And as well as body sensors, you know, you, all of a sudden we have this monster amount of data. And the question is, how do we sort through and find things that predict pretty well? And do they have stability? You know, so does something that predicts in 2015, you know, do we want need to, can we use that until 2020 or do we need to be checking, updating every single year? And so I think that's going to be a treasure trove, uh, particularly for behavioral economics, because we're so open-minded about what might make a difference. It might be emotion. It might be what people are looking at. It might be what your neighbors are doing. You know, any, you know, we're kind of, you know, we're very, you know, wide-eyed and open-minded compared to the traditional approach in economics, which is focused basically on prices and information. You know, it's, I think it's also interesting what you've done, and I'm curious if there was a another trigger for this, or it all started at the same time, is bringing the the game theory in, and then looking at the neuroscience of game theory. So one is making, I think there was an experiment that you were doing with the audience in your TED talk, and looking at the various intervals, and you could see the spikes where people would respond. Uh, just fascinating that you could see that all in the scans. Yeah, that, I mean that, that's that started much earlier because game theory is something. Um, that is really bit, made a fundamental shift in social sciences, mostly in economics, to a large extent also political science, and a little bit less in anthropology and fields like that. But most of the work, like the way, the way our first year PhD students at Caltech are taught game theory, is they're taught that a, you know, a game is a specification of moves that people make and then things that happen and how they value those outcomes. Okay, great. That could apply to bargaining over a, a rug in the Arab Bazaar. It could be playing rock, paper, scissors, at poker, negotiating with Iran, you know, and so forth. It's, it's meant to apply to all these different things, the same math. But the, the main analytical tool they're, they're taught is called equilibrium analysis, which basically means everybody has correctly figured out what everyone else is going to do. And so they reach this kind of equilibrium of coordinated beliefs. And that's the first, that's not true, <laughs> number one. And number two, it's not very practically interesting because it doesn't, in, in this equilibrium analysis, it doesn't tell you who's, who's, who's really skilled and who's not and what it means to be skilled. So we've developed some other types of theories in which people basically have different levels of skill. So some people are just kind of clueless or they do something very heuristic. You know, so an amateur poker player will often play tight, which means, you know, I get really good cards and I bet a lot. I get crummy cards and I don't bet. And if you're a good poker player, you love that because this person's very predictable, right? So the, the, the amateur is not being, is not thinking about the consequences of his actions for somebody who's really smart and can tell, you know, what their cards are from how much they bet. And then the higher level thinkers, you know, think I got to, I figure those guys out and then I figure out the guys who figure those people and so forth. So we developed a bunch of these tools and um, have been applying them to lots of ex- laboratory experiments, which is a kind of testing ground and then a little bit in other, places and starting to look and see, you know, in the brain, do you see these kind of like steps of reasoning 
you know, do people who are doing more, it turns out people who are doing more steps of reasoning seem to have areas, activity in what are called mentalizing or some kind of, it's called theory of mind areas. You know, I, I have to think about another person and what that person knows. They might know something different than me. Why do they bet high? You know, I have to try to infer their intention or their hidden information. So that, that's been very uh, useful. I got to tell you, one of my favorite conversations in the last year was with Robert Allman. And just mm -hmm. obviously he was, he was bringing things down for, for me and the audience. But yeah. just to listen to him, the, the thinking, and he was making the simple metaphors, something as simple as like, if, you're, if both sides are prepared to fight, truly prepared to fight, then you don't fight. On the other side, it's when one side is not prepared to fight and one side is ready to fight. It's usually when there's a fight. And now, of course, some people might hear that and think politically, uh, he's, he is sounding, uh, very hawkish or whatnot. But you have to, you have to look at someone's career like that and say, hold on. I might not be able to absorb all the math that he has done behind this, but this is a math equation that he is. He, he those words coming out of his mouth are backed by math. Correct. Yeah, actually, he is a um, he is a really remarkable figure, very um, extremely charismatic, and and it, and as you said, it's an unusual combination because the math he does is really, really difficult. You know. <laughs> Uh, but then sometimes what comes out of it is a, is a simple answer. I and mean, that's really what you're hoping for, right? You're hoping that a deep analysis tells you something simple. So I'll, I'll give you, I'll tell you one story related to that, which is here's one of the strangest things about uh, game theory. So suppose we're playing a, a hide and seek type of game. Uh, so we actually did this, for example, with some subjects. So they press, they, they both see on separate computer screens, they both see a, um, a square on the left or on the right. So the game consists of, do you pick left or right? And one of them is a hider, and the hider basically wants to pick the different place. So if, I, if I'm the hider, I want to pick left and you pick right. Or I pick right and you pick left. I, we want to, I want to mismatch. I want to hide from you. The seeker wants to match, right? So the seeker wants to pick left if, you, if the opponent picks left or ratch on right. And it turns out that if you change the rewards, so suppose you change the rewards so if, if I get caught, uh, if the seeker finds the person in the left spot, like if they both pick left, haha, the seeker gets a big prize. And you make that prize go up and up and up. Because we can control this right in the experiment. We can pay whatever we want. And we tell the, tell the subjects or, uh, or they figure it out by trial and error. So it turns out the following principle applies, which seems completely ridiculous, which is the, the more we increase the reward, the special reward from matching on left, from seeking on left successfully, the less often people will do it. The logic is similar to your example about fighting. And the reason is, I know you're going to go for that. And, and so you know that I know you're going to go for it, so you don't actually go for it. And so it has, it has an, an incredibly strange prediction, which is that the, um, the person who could benefit from the reward sort of ignores it. And the person who um, doesn't benefit from the reward moves in the opposite direction. It seems completely mind-blowing. Now, here's the kicker. With humans, they don't quite move in that direction as much as they should. So what they do is somewhere between kind of picking left and right equally often, which is sort of a natural starting point, and they kind of move in the direction of this game theoretic prediction a little bit. But there's another group of subjects who play really, really closely Chimps? to the predicted equilibrium, which is chimpanzees. <laughs> yes. See, I'm prepared. <laughs> I know. You, you, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's chimpanzees. It's amazing. And they're good strategic thinkers when it comes to game theory. They do what the equations yeah, say. Correct, correct. They, they, and and obviously it's it's mostly kind of learning. So we think it's a combination of two things. They're they're actually pretty attentive. Like if you see films of the chimps, there's some online from my colleagues in Nagoya, and called the Primate Research Institute (PRI) in Japan. Um, they're actually quite attentive, and also they they do. You know, a bunch of their food comes from doing these experiments. So they, they do it like at lunchtime when they're a little bit hungry and then they get apple cube rewards until basically they're full and then they kind of quit playing and they monkey around and they want to go back to their play facility. But they also, they seem to learn better in the sense that they respond, they keep track of what their opponent has done a little bit better than people. And my colleague Tetsuzura Matsuzawa's theory is, which is quite controversial, but very, very intriguing, is that they're actually pretty good at keeping track of uh, uh, opponents in competition because basically language didn't take up all the space in the brain that it takes up in our brain. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they actually have preserved skills that are useful in their environment because um, they play a lot of games that are similar to hide and seek. 
and they're and in a sense they may actually be even better than us um at least in, in, intuitively you know like i think there's no doubt these people with a lot of training and practice could kind of catch up to the chimps but it, it does look like there's this interesting difference dna wise we're still pretty close what is it 98 point? absolutely yeah. yeah 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 they're very <laughs> close they're very close i mean one of the things when you work with them is you you know a, a a one or two year old kid and a chimp are basically the same species, just about, you know, um, they're pretty selfish except within, you know, within sort of boundaries of their play group and stuff like that. Um, and it, it, I think it gives you a sort of a certain amount of humility and appreciation of, uh, of other species. If you didn't have that in the first place that, um, uh, and, and one reason the Japanese are very chimp crazy is they, they have a, there's a, a type of macaque monkey native to Japan. So it's the only developed country that has kind of its own native monkey. And and they, they take it, as the Japanese often do, they take it very seriously as a kind of moral obligation to um, learn about these chimps and take care of them and try to understand them and stuff like that. So actually that, that turned out to be a, it's, a, it's a very interesting area of research and they've done a lot of other very um, fascinating things there. Yeah, it is. It's uh, it's very cool. I had Lori Santos on my show, and she was uh, she's done some really cool mm. stuff with uh, yes. with monkeys and whatnot. Um, hey, let me one last thing I wanted to kind of jump into really quick, and it's it's kind of a big picture thing. But we're talking about what makes a, you know economic growth in a society, and this is kind of a a little bit of a jump off, but still in your world. And so there's there's saving and, and there's investing and there's there's all kinds of things that what what can generate that growth in a society. And one of the things that is intriguing view is trust what's the what how does trust because trust correlates with economic growth doesn't it correct talk about that and how that came to be in your field of vision okay yeah great so so we define trust in a very specialized way and and like most things economists are kind of reductionists right so we like to try at least in in step one is to reduce something complicated to something not so complicated to understand it and then of course you're going to turn out you left things out and you have 2.0 2.0 and 3.0, and you know the theories get a little better each time. But we really value simplicity. So the way we study trust is: uh, you have ten dollars, you can just keep it; nothing happens. Or you can invest it. I mean, the experiment will triple it; it becomes thirty dollars. And then me, I'm what we might call a trustee or kind of the second mover. You know, I look at this thirty dollars that you invested, or rather, the ten you invested that became thirty, and I say, well, I can just keep all that if I want to. Or I can pay it back, right? So it's like two business partners who you know do business over the internet, and at any one point, one guy can just take all the money and embezzle the money and run away. So, so we call this in economics um, a contract with limited enforcement, or with moral hazard, or with hidden action. All, what all those things mean is, I can't I can't penalize the person if I invest the ten, it becomes thirty, and they don't give me some, back some and share. I can't penalize them. Yeah, and the experiments we do, we don't know who they are. We don't have their email. The experimenter does, but we won't tell you. You can't, uh, you know, um, shame them on Twitter. You can't go and punch them in the face. You can't send an email saying you're a jerk. And so the question is, are people trustworthy in the sense that when they know this guy sacrificed some money or risked some money to generate money we could both share, do I share some back with you? And the answer is, you know, it, it depends. Mostly very few people, or sorry, there are very few subject pools in which a huge percentage of people, like 80 or 90%, keep all the money and don't share. That's rarely seen. And what's common is that, um, you know, out of the $30 that's created, if you invest 10, probably you get 10 back from your risky trusting investment, and the other guy keeps 20. So look, people aren't saints, right? <laughs> Typically, what. You know, in other words, the people who are in the position of deciding how much of this money they can keep, even though they did nothing to really create it, they didn't stick their neck out like the first person did who invested, they do keep a lot of money, right? I mean, so pure selfishness is always part of, should be part of our understanding of human nature, right? And whether you think it's morally right or morally wrong, you know, what, what happens is do people do, a lot of people do keep, um, some people keep all the money, some keep more than their, more than an equal share. And so that's what we call trust. So the, the act of risking the money means I'm pretty sure this person's going to feel morally obliged to send some back to me. Otherwise, I'll just keep it myself and nothing will happen. The other trust measures that are often used, so we actually study trust in this game and you kind of see if 
you know, do children, uh, is there a certain age at which children learn to be trustworthy? It looks like the answer is, yeah, that, you know, ki kids start out pretty selfish and they gradually learn norms of kind of what's appropriate behavior, which might be specialized to their culture as well. So there may be, you know, countries where there's rampant um, corruption among the government, you know, the kids might learn, what they basically learn is grab whatever you can because that's what the people around me do. That's okay here in country X. You can, and you can also look at um, the influence of, um, you know, could you causally create more trust by what people say or is there certain facial expressions that make people look trustworthy? You know, so it's been quite a, a cornucopia of, uh, of interesting things to do. And, and, and those games also basically originated a little bit in psychology and economics together over the years, starting in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we actually published the first one in economics in 1988. And now they've migrated to where they're used a lot in neuroscience and psychology, you know, because they're simple to do and they really do capture an element of trust. You know, trust is this sort of economic risk that another person will honor what I, what I see as an obligation, even though they don't really have to and there's no penalty if they don't. And as you, as you mentioned, that's, so the trust that's correlated with economic growth is usually something even simpler, but we hope reasonably related, which is you ask people questions like, in general, do you trust strangers? And even though that might seem to be a hard question to answer, you know, you, you'd want to know, well, what do you mean in general? And what do I know about the strangers? But people answer it. And the percentage of people saying, yes, I trust strangers, it's highest in Scandinavia. Uh, and Singapore actually is quite high. And then it goes down, 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 and it's quite low in some countries in Africa and the Philippines, I believe, and then a few other kinds of places. And that just the answer to that question seems to be associated with with the health of an economy, even when you control for other things like do you have oil or some other valuable resource and level of education and things like that. Yeah, I can't vouch for Sweden, but I've been to Singapore a ton, and yes, yeah. that's true. <laughs> that's yeah, true. Yeah. That's absolutely true. And, and there, are, there are also very striking norms. For example, uh, Japan is a place, again, I've traveled there quite a bit academically and in other ways. And um, they are very, very proud about lost property. So mm -hmm. they have an amazing norm that if somebody loses property and you, and you, whether you're a hotel clerk or a policeman or just some person walking on the street, everybody has a kind of obligation to help get it back to the person. So we were um, eating in a little izakaya kind of barbecue place which was absolutely fantastic and it was raining so we had an umbrella and i also had given my son a little a little plastic bag of yen of japanese money so he could have his own money and you know pay for things and and so you know, we were jet lagged and and cranky from the rain and well fed thank you japanese people uh and so we left the best food and, <laughs> yeah absolutely wonderful and generally very healthy although you can eat fried everything and um uh all kinds of yummy stuff Anyway, so we, we were walking down the street, fortunately not too quickly, and this woman comes running after us, like, hello, 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 with her um, not great English, and she was carrying our umbrella and our little bag of money, and she had, which, and the bag of money had about, you know, four, the equivalent of $4 in it or something like that. It wasn't, you know, a big bag of money, and what it was was she had, she remembered us and had chased us down, and, and she was running you know, like the Jap Japanese have these excellent marathon runners. Like she's, maybe she was trained, you know, but <laughs> she was running like, this was an extremely important thing to return this umbrella and this $4. This was a really big deal. And then, and she was very apologetic, you know, oh, I'm sorry I let you leave without this. Uh, like it was all her fault. It was just amazing. I have to share one right back at you. I was in to Tokyo for the first time. I had to go clear across the city. I got into the taxi. He did not speak a lick of English. I showed him a card in Japanese. He drove me to the other side of the city or near the Rapungi area. I, right. I was at, I was an hour early from my meeting. I got out. I started walking around a mall. Uh, about an hour later, I go up to the top of this 60-story tower. I get off the elevator. And my taxi driver is standing. Standing there with my phone, he had waited an hour to hand me wow. my to hand me my phone. I tried to give him money, which I've now since learned right. is a bad thing. Yeah, uh, yeah which, he, which he, he was a little bit insulting. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, that was stupid. Yeah. But uh, but he yeah, got yeah. in the elevator, ran away from me, and wanted nothing. And it was just the most amazing experience. Wow, that's great. You you beat him on. That's really something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but hey, listen, I want to read one little thing from you that I think is great. I think, I think it's from you and your partner, maybe. But I just love this quote: "The Platonic metaphor of the mind is the charioteer driving twin horses of reason." And emotion is on the right track, except that cognition is a smart pony and emotion a big elephant. I love that. I love that. You know, I've just been, I'm working on a neuroeconomics book and I've just been reading about emotion, which is 
very messy emotion, particularly emotion and cognition. You know, what are they different and where are they in the brain? And it's one of the messiest areas. Um, but this is a long debate over thousands of years of philosophy and psychology, sort of which, which one's in charge. So George Lowenstein's view, he has this phrase, thanks to his daughter, called emote control, that the, that the emotions are really kind of in control. And a lot of times what we say cognitively is just kind of an you know, excuse we make to ourselves or to somebody else about somebody we want to do emotionally. And almost any statement about the strength of emotion and cognition isn't likely to be quite right. And it, it may depend also on the nature of the emotions. So I think there's not much doubt that the most evolutionarily important emotions that are kind of conserved in the brain, which means our brain it senses fear very much like rat brains do. So fear, disgust, uh, sadness, you know, are probably the ones that are most primary and kind of visceral. But there's also lots of, you know, so they're going to work in a particular way. We can see fear in people's faces really well. It's pretty much the same across all cultures. Uh, but other things like guilt and shame and embarrassment are social emotions. You know, they have to do with w- whether we did something wrong, and that will depend upon whether we perceived it as wrong and whether we're sociopaths. So emotion is pretty complicated. But I think the basically in the in from 1920 to 1950 the predominant method in psychology was behaviorism which said you know we'll just give somebody a stimulus and see how they respond and the you know, that stimulus response will be the essence of what's going on in their brain and we won't bother to look in there or speculate it was very kind of sort of puritanical you know it's like the, you know, the brain was like clothed in a burqa you know we're not, we're not going to look in there and we don't want to see any of it and so emotion was was left out. I mean, B.F. Skinner said emotion is just fictitious. You, you know, it's just it's just a myth, mythical thing, which is is silly. You know, and then came what's called the cognitive um, revolution or the information processing revolution, around 1960 to maybe 1990. And the idea there was people are like computers. And again, there was what is an emo- you know what emotions does a computer have? None. Okay, well forget about emotion. So it was really just kind of neglected for a long time. And to the extent that people thought about the emotion, they thought of it as this kind of like bug that we have these kind of low level emotions and we need, you know, cognition will kind of control our passions um, as opposed to the modern view, which is that emotions are a kind of information. I mean, they, they evolved to get us ready very, very quickly to deal with very, various challenges. And that's not to say that, you know, emotions can't run amok. And, you know, if you get angry because somebody bumped into you at a bar and you've been drinking alcohol, it's the right move is not to kill that person with a gun, right? That is not, you know, that's not what the emotions for, right? So there's no question that, and also there's some amazing results on, um, uh, essentially tunnel vision, right? So when you're in a highly aroused state, people can actually perceive things that are in the periphery of a visual scene. They can perceive things better. They actually see better. They see better. Um, but that also creates something called a weapon focused effect, which means, if you're if you're not a cop and you're not trained and you're at some place and somebody pulls out a gun, you'll stare at the gun and you won't notice whether the person's black or white. And so it turns out their studies have shown fairly clearly that you know what happens there is the fear helps you notice the weapon and pay a lot of attention to it because that's the thing that you're afraid of. But all the things surrounding it are just kind of erased, and so and so people um, can't pick the the person who held the gun out of a lineup very accurately, for example. So, you know, anyway, so emotion does some really great things that it's kind of built to do. But in a modern world, particularly, uh, where the consequences of acting out on certain emotions and the amount of stuff we have to process is much harder, you know, sometimes emotions are really our, our, our powerful weapon and sometimes um, it is it is kind of a bug in, in the system that's designed for them that is now in a modern world. You've been kind enough to give me 50 minutes of your time today. I can't keep you going, but clearly I could go down the path of asking questions and just going to school all day long here. Great. So I, yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, listen, I, you're easy to find on the internet. Uh, a quick Google search will bring up just about everything. Is, is there a particular website that I can send people to or that you would like people to go to to check out more information on you and your work? Uh, actually, not exactly. Is My website's really in disrepair. Yeah, I think I think if you Google, you'll see some public talks, which are kind of the most accessible. Yeah, and if people really want to read the academic papers, you know, the academic folks, or even other people who are interested in really reading the original scientific research, is not it's not too hard to find. There's something called ResearchGate, 
and academia.edu and Google Scholar is actually extremely good. Google Scholar is amazing uh, at compiling, you know, what people have done and you can see, you know, which papers are the most popular by citation and you can kind of, you know, figure your way out. Well, Colin, thank you for taking a flyer today. I guess you never know what you're going to get into when someone says they want to interview you, right? Right, from Saigon, <laughs> which is a, which I've been in Vietnam once. It's a fantastic place. I'm really uh, on the sabbatical, actually, my first Did that scare you? Hold on. Did that was, scare you? Or you're like, oh, gosh, oh, Colin, hold on. He's in Saigon. What, what is this? What am I getting into? <laughs> <laughs> well, you told me you were in Asia. Uh, actually, in my, for my sabbatical year, I was trying to get my wife to go to Singapore, but she works for a company which was very lenient about travel, which is wonderful, but she had to be near particular, a, a small number of particular places. Mm. And so um, one is is close to a Sinatra, which is great, but my, maybe next time we'll go to Shanghai or um, someplace uh, near it because it's just such a, a fascinating region. It's a, it's a corner of the world where there's uh, I call it the parallel universe. It's like when you first get to Tokyo, yeah. everything in Tokyo is the same, but it's very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> oh, but yeah, no, that's right. You know, it's you know one of the strongest biases from psychology is what's called in-group, back-group bias. And one of the biases is, for example, if you haven't traveled in Asia, you have the stereotype that every Asian country is kind of the same. You know, everyone <laughs> no. eats the same food. <laughs> right? and, it's, and again, I mean, J- Japan's an extreme outlier probably because of um, genetic sort of isolation. You know, they don't have much immigration, for example. But even, I'm sure, uh, I haven't been in the Southeast Asia other than Vietnam. Thailand, obviously, and um Cambodia and uh, obviously you know look at China versus Taiwan and Hong Kong right I mean they're 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 big you know differences in the region so it's a place that we'd love to spend more time Cambodia is where I first looked at a little girl and I said okay here is where the Indian gene pool and the Chinese gene pool met you can right. just see it on her face you're like yeah. wow I'm in a different place this is so cool Fun stuff we could talk, but that's a whole. We could talk about that for hours. I, hey, listen, I hope you come on again in the future. But I thank you for taking time today. Thanks. Yeah, Tom. I'd love to do it. Do it again sometime. Take Good. care. Thanks, Michael. Bye bye. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor protecting against a crash, or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.